Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 284. I'm the host, Kyle Lanzalone. On today's show, I got news on the war in Ukraine and the U.S.-Russian relationship. So be sure to share today's show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute. You can find it on the blog at antiwar.com. We post the video version of the show on Odyssey, Rumble, and YouTube. My Twitter handle is at Kyle Anzalone underscore, and you can donate to the show at Patreon, Subscribestar, or through Crypto, all that information in the show notes page. Also in the show notes page, you can find the information for the sponsor of the show, Paloma Verde, Paloma Verde, CBD.com, promo code PEACE, uh, $75 or more is what you got to spend, but you'll get 20% off and the show will get a kickback when you use the promo code P-E-A-C-E. It's been a great way uh, to help the show, you know, get funding to cover all the hosting fees and a lot of, you know, some of the other minor costs of running a podcast. And it's been very helpful because, you know, listeners of the show now are just ordering and we got money coming in every month through that link. And of course, everybody I talk to say that the products at Paloma Verde are fantastic. I myself like them, uh, but it's always great when I hear from listeners that the products are effective. In fact, one of the products that I get the most positive feedback about is actually their CBD dog treats. Uh, Both the co-host of the show, Connor Freeman, and other listeners have told me that it's been great, especially for their dogs that are getting a little bit older. So you got a dog, maybe you know, needs to calm down sometimes or just getting a little bit older, looking at dealing with the joint pain a little bit better or something like that. Uh, check out the products they got for dogs at Paloma Verde, Paloma Verde, CBD.com, promo code PEACE, and let's get into the show. First article I have today, I wrote for the Libertarian Institute on June 2nd, Russia controls 20% of Ukraine while Kiev loses 60 to 100 soldiers per day, and that is from Ukrainian President Zodomir Zelensky. And I write that Zelensky has painted a grim picture of his country's war effort in recent interviews. Zelensky said his forces are suffering hundreds of casualties every day, and Russia now controls 20% of Ukraine. On Tuesday, Newsmats interviewed the Ukrainian leader in Kiev. Zelensky claimed that his forces were suffering mounting casualties but holding their positions. The situation is difficult. We're losing 60 to 100 soldiers per day as killed in action and something around 500 as wounded in action, he said. So we are holding our defensive perimeters. The president did not present an overall casualty figure. Kiev and Moscow have been tight-lipped about their losses. In mid-April, Zelensky said between 2,500 and 3,000 Ukrainian soldiers had died. On April 19th, the New York Times published an estimate from U.S. intelligence suggesting Ukrainian losses were far higher at 5,500 to 11,000. On Thursday, Zelensky indicated that defensive perimeters were breaking and Russian forces were advancing. In an address to the Lutzenberg legislature, Zelensky said that invading forces now control 20% of Ukraine. The mission of Russia's gains comes after Moscow's forces captured the key Donbass city of Sverizdik, uh, Dokhsk. And while the high-level Ukrainian officials continue to draw a hard line ceding any territory to Russia, it will be increasingly difficult to achieve the goal of reclaiming all of uh, Ukraine's territory as Moscow slowly takes more land. And so that uh, city there that I butchered the name... um, Apparently, the the fighting there has resumed, and at least on the Ukrainian side, they've claimed to have made some gains in the counteroffensive, which wouldn't be surprising if they are like levying a counteroffensive. But I think they claim they controlled now twenty percent of the city, and that would be um, somewhat significant, depending on how the city is laid out and exactly what points they're claiming to have captured. Overall, uh, Russia now controls ninety five percent of Ukraine's Luhansk region. Uh, Russia continues to make territorial gains in eastern Ukraine and now controls 85% of the Luhansk Oblast, which makes up the northern half of the Donbass region. The pro-Kiev governor of Luhansk said Friday that Ukrainian forces might be forced to retreat from the near 
uh, city of uh, the the one we just talked about them uh, a couple of cities in the region and uh, they're the last holdouts in the area and with that Russia would then uh, likely control all of the Luhansk region and we hear from Sergey Lavrov um, the Russian foreign minister that the liberation of the Donbass is an unconditional priority, and I wrote this for antiwar.com on May 29th. After three months of war, talks between Kiev and Moscow have stalled for over a month. On Sunday, Russia's top diplomat conveyed some of the Kremlin's demand to end the conflict. However, Moscow claims Ukrainian government officials are making contradictory statements preventing diplomacy from progressing. In an interview with France's TF1 new, uh, television channel, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said taking control of the Donbass was an unconditional priority and the people of eastern Ukraine should be free to vote to decide their future. The liberation of Donetsk and Luhansk regions, recognized by the Russian Federation as independent states, is an unconditional priority. He added that the people of Ukraine must decide for themselves. And I'm guessing what he's talking about is holding a potential referendum in eastern Ukraine. Now, you know, there's probably a way to do this where it would and could reflect the will of the people. But my guess is this happening uh, amid a war would not allow that to happen as a lot of people have fled from this region and it could, you know, lead to territory going to Russia that, you know, maybe the people there really don't want to live in Russia and, and that would be an issue. Um, so Russia has bet the Donbass republics, Donetsk and Luhansk, since they broke with Kiev in 2014. In recent weeks, Russia has focused its military operations on seizing eastern Ukraine, including the Donbass. Moscow's forces have made slow gains and now control 95% of Luhansk. It's unclear if Kiev would agree to cede any territory to end the war. President Zodomir Zelensky has suggested multiple times that he could surrender Ukrainian territory. However, these statements are repeatedly contradicted by Zelensky or high-level Ukrainian officials. On Saturday, Zelensky told CNN's Fareed Zakaria his country would reclaim all of Ukraine's Donbass. And this is from Zelensky. When Ukraine says it will be fighting to regain its territory loss, it means Ukraine will be fighting to regain, get all of its territory back. It doesn't mean anything else. The Kremlin blames the lack of consistency within the Ukrainian government for the stalled talks. And uh, this is the Kremlin spokesperson. The Ukrainian leadership consistently made contradictory statements. This does not this does not allow us to fully understand what Ukraine, the Ukrainian side wants. And I do think that's a somewhat fair criticism for the Russian government to make, uh, given how all over the place the Ukrainian government has been. Now, Russia not having a solid negotiating partner in Kiev has something, of course, to do with the fact that Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, one more interesting uh, note here. There is an article in the Gray Zone this week uh, that covered how uh, the Department of Homeland Security is now concerned about white nationalists returning to the U.S. with battlefield experience. And on the ground in Ukraine, we had a French journalist killed. Uh, the Nets article is from Will Porter, published at the Libertarian Institute on June 2nd. Ukraine sats human rights commissioner. Ukrainian lawmakers have voted to remove human rights commissioner uh, accused of accusing the official of doing too little to protect civilians amid on, the ongoing Russian invasion and tarnishing Kiev's reputation abroad with unverified atrocity stories. The Rada moved to fire... Uh, the Ukrainian official earlier this week with 234 deputies voting to oust her, according to local media reports. Her five-year term was set to expire in 2023, but her early dismissal is not yet clear who will fill the position, often described as the human rights uh, official in Western press coverage. A member of the ruling Servant of the People's Party, that's Zelensky's party, and the deputy chair of a parliamentary ethics committee outlined a number of complaints against the official, including that she had spent too much time in Western 
Europe since Russian the Russian invasion began. After February 24th, the current Rada Commissioner for Human Rights spent time abroad, but not in Russia or Belarus, where status and power could help prisoners, deportees, and victims of the occupation. Uh, the the uh, member of Zelensky's party continued, hardly exercised her authority to organize humanitarian corridors. The official went on to note um, that the U- former human rights official uh, incomprehensible concentration on numerous details of unnatural sexual crimes and the rape of children in occupied territories, which could not be confirmed by evidence, saying those allegations only harmed Ukraine and distracted from the world media. As Uh, the world media from Ukraine's real needs. As commissioner, she repeatedly accused Russian forces of grave human rights abuses, including rape and sexual abuse of minors as young as one, uh, claims repeatedly echoed in Western press. While firsthand testimony of forensic examinations of victims indicate Ukrainian women have endured horrific abuses at the hands of some Russian soldiers. Her high profile media work has come under fire from local reporters, human rights activists, and lawyers in an open letter published late last month, nearly 150 Ukrainian journalists and academics urged the commissioner to be more careful in publicized war crime accusations, not only asking her to provide sufficient evidence of such charges, but to avoid sensationalizing grisly details at the expense of her victim and their families. When publicly communicating sex crimes during wartime, especially when victims are children, it is important to take into account not only the ethics of the warding, but also the justification and expediency of publishing certain words that may shock. We are concerned about the Ukrainian media uh, will become just a platform for spreading horrific details about sexual crimes during war instead of serving uh, as voices in support of collecting evidence in relevant criminal cases and fair punishment and spreading information about where and how to control uh, survivors of violence. Her dismissal was opposed by ETS President Petro Poroshenko's European Solidarity Party, as well as former Prime Minister Yulia Tomashenko's uh, Fatherland Party, though garnered significant support among uh, serving other people's deputies. The former commissioner has alleged that President Zodimir Zelensky personally authorized her firing ahead of the parliamentary vote, though her deputy chief of presidential office rejected that charge. Some activists, uh, such as the ZMINA Human Rights Center, argued that her dismissal was unconstitutional, while others supporters have noted the Human Rights Commissioner's role often been publicized, including prior attempts to remove uh, the, that official last fall. Now, you know, the, I think one of the most important things is that a lot of these claims have made it into Western press. And so, the, you know, these are just outright false propaganda claims that the Ukrainian government doesn't even back. And yet they were repeated uh, without any real uh, looking into it by the, the Western press. And Caitlin Johnstone has a fantastic article detailing uh, some, some of the cases where this happened. Next up, uh, moving on a little bit, talking uh, about what the U.S. is doing here. Dave DeCamp has a really important new article from June 1st at Antiwar.com. U.S. has been supporting Ukraine with offensive cyber operations. Uh, The head of the U.S. Cyber Command told Sky News on Wednesday that the U.S. has been conducting offensive cyber operations to support Ukraine in its war against Russia. He said the U.S. has conducted a series of operations across the full spectrum, offensive, defensive, and information operations. He didn't share any details of the cyber operations, but his disclosure is the first time U.S. officials have admitted to launching cyber attacks in support of Ukraine in the war. NATO has stepped up its cyber cooperation with Ukraine in recent months by allowing Kiev to join its cyber operations center, known as the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, CCDCEO. On Monday, Ukrainian officials met with the CCDCEOE uh, steering committee for the first time. 
the general's disclosure is the latest example of U.S. support for Ukraine that risk provoking Moscow after Russia invaded. Biden warned that Russian cyber attacks were coming, but it has not materialized yet. You know, and, and Dave points this out, but really important that NATO has asserted that any Russian cyber attacks would be uh, treated in, and could trigger NATO Article 5, the Collective Defense Clause, and be the, the cause for going to war with Russia. And yet here the U.S. is carrying out these same operations. This is extremely provocative and concerning. As is, Next story by Dave DeCamp, also from June 1st. Britain seeks U.S. approval to send Ukraine MLRS rockets. The U.K. is uh, seeking permission from Washington to send Ukraine U.S.-made M270 multiple launch rocket systems MLRS. Politico reported on Wednesday. A source told Politico that U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson spoke with President Biden about the possible M270 transfer on Wednesday, which will be followed up by a conversation between U.K. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. The 270 MLRS range has about 50 miles, which means it could be used to target Russian territory. The Biden administration said Wednesday uh, announced it was sending similar rocket systems, the high mobility artillery rocket systems known as HIMARS. The HIMARS munitions the U.S. is providing to Ukraine have a range of about 50 miles. U.S. officials insist they have received insurances from Ukrainian officials that they won't use the weapons to hit targets inside Russia, but sending the rockets still is a major escalation. And, uh, yeah, the, the U S transfer, I think was, uh, another $700 million. The Biden administration approved to go, uh, to Ukraine. And then this provoked Russia to hold, uh, drills with this nuclear forces. I think, uh, what was it, 1100 Russian forces to part in those drills. And then it's also worth knowing, noting that Poland agreed to transfer 18, 150 uh, millimeter high mobile howitzers uh, to Ukraine as well. This from Dave DeCamp on May 27th at antiwar.com. U.S. Army awards Raytheon 768 or seven six hundred and eighty seven million uh, six eight seven million to replenish stingers sent to Ukraine. The Army hasn't bought Stinger since 2005, but there is new demand as Biden is shipping thousands to Ukraine. The U.S. Army has awarded Raytheon with a contract of nearly $700 million for Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to replenish stockpiles that have been sent to Ukraine, Reuters reported on Friday. Since Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th, the U.S. has shipped 1,400 Stinger missiles to Ukraine. The U.S. Army hasn't purchased Stinger since 2005, as it has been planning to upgrade the next generation of shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles. But the U.S. policy of sending thousands of Stingers to Ukraine has put the aging weapon in high demand, and Raytheon, the former employee of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, stands to make long-term profits on the war. Producing the Stingers could take time, as Raytheon CEO Greg Hayes has said the company may not be able to manufacture more until about 2023, according to the Military Times, because some components are no longer commercially available. The U.S. has also shipped 5,000 Javelin anti-tank missiles since Russia invaded. Javelins are a joint project between Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. President Biden recently visited a Lockheed plant producing the anti-tank missiles in Alabama and has shown support for the arms maker. As a part of the massive $40 billion aid package President Biden signed for Ukraine, the Pentagon will receive $8.7 billion to replenish its stockpiles of Stingers, Javelins, and other weapons being sent to Ukraine. The package will also provide about $11 billion in presidential drawdown authority, which will allow Biden to ship weapons to Ukraine from the U.S. military stockpiles. So, of course, it is the uh, former employer of the current defense secretary that is making so much money off of this policy. 
Ned Stupp, uh, very bad news from Dave uh, DeCamp here, June 2nd at antiwar.com. U.S. officials can't imagine the U.S. and Russia negotiating new START replacement. A senior Biden administration official told the New York Times that right now it's almost impossible to imagine the U.S. and Russia negotiating a replacement for new START the last remaining arms control treaty between the two powers before it expires. Now, this is years off. Things change, right? So don't want to raise a ton of panic here. However, if this treaty goes, we're in a, a much, much more dangerous situation with nuclear weapons. And so saving this, expanding this treaty should be an absolute priority and making sure there's enough diplomatic ground between the U.S. and Russia to get that done is extremely important. Um, and as Dave is writing here, uh, U.S. officials are basically admitting that that can happen because of the current relationship between the U.S. and Russia. Now, maybe in a little bit of good news, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said Turkey is ready to bring Russia, Ukraine, and the UN together in Istanbul and play a role in possible observation mechanism in a phone call with Russian President Vladimir Putin. And look, you know, it, it's one thing for Turkey to offer this. It's another for it to actually materialize. Uh, but the fact that this is a statement being put out by Turkey, maybe they feel like there is a little bit of a, a desire on, on all sides here to come to a, res a resolution to this. And, uh, you, you know, Turkey is obviously has a lot of things going on ge geopolitically right now. And, you know, I've spent so much time on the show talking about, you know, Syria and their internal uh, Kurdish repression. Uh, and then, of course, their military operations in Iraq, the fact that they have millions of Syrian refugees, their problem with Greece, their territorial ambitions in the eastern Mediterranean <laughs> Their role in the Libyan war, uh, their role in Cyprus, things like this are, are all extremely important to Turkey. And so there, there could be a lot of these kind of desires playing out here. But that Turkey is offering talks in essentially the only party in the entire planet doing so right now is absolutely fantastic. Oh, I want to mention uh, that uh, on, uh, on the talks real quick. Uh, there was a Ukrainian ambassador to the UN said that any politician that makes a deal with Russia has no future. And so I think that's kind of the reason, uh, one of the reason why talks have been stalled, because I really don't think anybody in Ukraine is interested in negotiating at this point. So let's get into the Ukrainian negotiating position a little bit more. I have this article from May 29th at antiwar.com. Zelensky hopes for regime change in Moscow, plans to reclaim Crimea. Ukrainian President Zodomir Zelensky says he wanted talks with a Russian president. However, he hoped that president, that person was someone other than Vladimir Putin. He also called for his country to reestablish his pre-Civil War borders. CNN's Fried Zakaria hosted Zelensky for an interview at the World Economic Forum. The event was sponsored by the foundation of Ukrainian bil billionaire Viktor Pinchuk. In his introduction, Zakaria framed the war as Ukraine uh, the war in Ukraine as Russia versus the world, which, of course, is such a mischaracterization. Uh, if you look at the countries that are actually sanctioning Russia, it's not even majority of the countries in the world. So to say this is Russia versus the world is just absurd. It's the West versus versus Russia. And, you know, portraying it as Russia versus the world, I think, gives the, you know, the Americans that this, uh, you know, the, the way that Biden portrays it, right, that it's a democracy versus autocracy. And we, we have to take on, you know, the, the villains of the world. Well, this really isn't the case. Nobody else sees it the way, but the West does. Um, during the interview, Zelensky indicated he was open to talks, but wanted regime change in Moscow first. This is from Zelensky. The war will be over sooner or later. I'm sure there will be some sort of peace full process, some sort of talks, and we would be discussing the issues of who Ukraine will negotiate with what president of the Russian Federation. I hope it will be a, 
a different president in the Russian Federation. The Ukrainian leader said his counterpart was living in a bubble of alternate reality and Putin was not keenly aware of the situation on the ground in Ukraine. Zakaria asked Zelensky, will Ukraine fight until it retakes all the territories it lost in 2014. Zakaria is referring to the breakaway Donbass republics and the Crimean Peninsula that was annexed by Russia. Zelensky responded affirmatively to the CNN host question, and he said, when Ukraine says it will be fighting to regain its territories lost, it means Ukraine will be fighting until it gets all of its territory back. It does not mean anything else. During an event last week at the World Economic Forum, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who's now 99 years old, by the way, and sounds an awful lot like uh, Chancellor Palpatine, uh, called on Kiev to cede territory to help resolve the conflict. Zelensky responded with harsh criticism of the former American official. Uh, Zelensky said, Mr. Kissinger has emerged from the deep past and said that part of Ukraine should be given to Russia to avoid alienation of Russia from Europe. It seems that Mr. Kissinger has 1989 uh, 1938 on the calendar instead of 2022. And that's of course a reference to, um, to, to, you know, appeasing Hitler and things like that. And that, uh, it just, you know, just interesting that Zelensky's calling out Kissinger in this way, especially when, um, no, it wasn't Kissinger. Never mind. Let's move on here. Let's, uh, NATO chief says Ukraine shouldn't drop goal of driving Russia out of Crimea. And so we have here Jen Stoltenberg uh, simply echoing what Zelensky said. And, uh, you know, interesting article here. But I want to move on to the next one, which I think is a little bit more alarming. Uh, This from Dave DeCamp, June 2nd at Antiwar.com. He says, NATO chief says West must brace for long haul in Ukraine. On Thursday, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg said the military alliance must be prepared to support Ukraine for the long haul. We have to be prepared for the long haul, Stoltenberg said, because we see this is war uh, has now just become a war of attrition or has now become a war of attrition. And so I think when you look at what's happening actually on the ground in Ukraine, as I started off uh, my most recent article from the Libertarian Institute, Russia controls 20% of Ukraine, with Russia making slow territorial gains in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine and the south, what uh, NATO is now presenting as what's happening is that, well, this is going to be a long war of attrition. We're eventually going to drive Russia out of Ukraine completely. And oh, this is, this is ugly. This is, this means it's going to be a very long war with a lot of dead Ukrainians and likely Ukraine losing more territory and eventually having to cede it anyways. Austin and Stoltenberg agreed to push NATO members to boost military spending. And so even with this, most NATO member states are not making uh, the 2% of spending their uh, GDP on military spending. Only eight of the 30 alliance members do that. And of course, the U.S. outspends the rest of the alliance by massive, massive numbers. And so... It's not even really, uh, even if all these countries were spending 2%, it still wouldn't solve what the 2%, uh, the minimum is there for. Uh, Basically, right, like if you're, if you're Croatia or if you're Latvia, whatever you're going to spend on your military is so insignificant to the trillion plus dollar uh, uh, American military budget uh, that... You know, with the Article 5 with NATO, there's really no point in spending a lot of money on your military. Now that, you know, they they do spend money on their military. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, you know, they're not going to invest in a force that could actually repel a Russian invasion because if Russia invades, it's going to be the Americans that are repelling the Russian invasion. And so I don't know how high you would need that number, given how high the U.S. military spending is. And maybe it's actually impossible to, you know, kind of solve for this uh, moral hazard created by NATO. And the real solution has to be the U.S. withdrawing, um, with, withdrawing its support from the European continent. 
Now, one of the things going on with NATO right now is Finland and Sweden have applied for NATO membership and Turkey so far has put a a, a hold on that. Even with that hold, we had the Pentagon mulling, uh, uh, planning more military drills with Finland and Sweden. Uh, This from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com on June 3rd. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, said said Friday that the U.S. military is weighing plans on how to increase participation in planned exercises with Finland and Sweden as the two nations are seeking NATO membership. But so far, it doesn't appear that there has been any positive steps towards uh, those two countries joining NATO, even though we've had uh, joint statements, say, from uh, Stoltenberg and Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying that, no, these countries are definitely going to be uh, admitted into NATO. Last kind of subject I want to cover here before wrapping up today is is the sanctions. Uh, Russia says it's hard to export grain due to Western sanctions on ships. I'm sure this is the case. Now, you know, the West is presenting that all the food problems going on in the world right now are because of Russia. Russia is mainly blaming the West for everything. And, uh, of course, both of these points are wrong. Uh, Both sides bear a lot of responsibility here. Of course, you could put a lot on Russia because of the initial invasion, but the Western sanctions are having a massive impact. And also the way the U.S. has, you know, destroyed and tried to raid the world economy for years and years and all the problems that that has caused. Now, the EU is looking at extending sanctions on Russia, but that is currently being blocked by Hungary uh, due to Hungary's objection to sanctioning uh, the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. And last up on the sanctions, the EU is considering uh, making breaking sanctions on Russia a crime. And this would take it from like, I guess, a financial penalty to you could potentially go to jail for, for it. Uh, far more serious uh, to, to carry out sanctions this way. And it, it's going to make it harder to unwind all of this, which is what needs to happen for the relationship between Russia and the West to start to normalize, to figure out uh, not just, you know, trade, which in an energy trade, which is important for Europe, but also, uh, you know, as we talked here about, you know, figuring out how to extend new start, how to have arms control agreements, how to basically unwind the tensions that have been so highly wound up over the past well, now 30 years, but really the past eight in Ukraine with the U.S. and uh, Western policies. All right, that's where I'm wrapping up the show for today. Hope everybody enjoyed the show. Just be sure to share it. You find it at the Libertarian Institute, antiwar.com, anywhere you can listen um, to podcasts. It should be up on audio podcasts. It's also on the Libertarian Institute, all podcast feed. Thanks, everyone.